Hello, everyone. My name is Brittany Bichkowski. So I'm a medical oncologist at Brigham and Women's in Dana-Farber, and I'm excited to be here today and talk about medications for cancer risk reduction. The medications that I will discuss are known as chemo prevention, but from a pharmacologic perspective, they are not chemotherapy. So the standard therapies, let me just move forward. Oh, I'm in a different view. Here we go. Excellent. So the standard therapies for breast cancer prevention are anti-estrogen therapies or hormonal therapies. They include selective estrogen modulators, also known as serums, aromatase inhibitors, clinical and clinical trial therapies. The serums include tamoxifen and raloxifene. The aromatase inhibitors include anastrozole and extamestane. There is a third aromatase inhibitor, and this is known as letrozole, but it is only approved for breast cancer treatment. So currently at Dana-Farber and Brigham and Women's, we have patients participating in a clinical trial looking at tamoxifen as a gel therapy. And you know, there's interest in this and how it may modulate breast cancer risk, but this is an ongoing study and we don't have the, the results of it yet. So our options for risk reducing therapies depend on a women's menopausal status. Premenopausal women are eligible for tamoxifen dosed at 20 milligrams or five milligrams. Postmenopausal women are eligible to take tamoxifen, raloxifene, anastrozole, or extamestane. Tamoxifen was FDA approved for breast cancer prevention in 1999. So we have a lot of data and experience with this medication in the prevention setting. This was based on data from three important clinical trials, the NSABP P1 trial, the Royal Marston trial, and the IBIS-1 study. The NSABP1 study was led by a collaborative surgical group in the United States, and this was the largest study, and it was well-designed. So from my perspective, it's the most important study comparing tamoxifen to placebo. The other medication options came later. Raloxifene was compared to tamoxifen in the STAR trial for postmenopausal women, and the results were published in 2006, and the FDA approval for raloxifene as a preventative therapy came out in 2007. Extamestane and anastrozole were studied later, and they can also be used for breast cancer prevention. So all of these medications have side effects. The one that stands out for most women is the fact that they can cause hot flashes. As a provider, the most concerning side effects are the serums, which are with the serums, which can cause blood. So all of these medications have side effects. And as I was saying, that I'm most concerned as a provider about the blood clots with tamoxifen in their serums. So blood clots in the legs are known as deep vein thromboses and blood clots in the lungs are known as pulmonary embolisms. Serums are not a good option for patients who have a personal history of blood clots, a family history of blood clots, or who are non-ambulatory. They should also be used with caution in women who are smokers or significantly overweight as those factors increase the risk of blood clots too. Tamoxifen has a small increased risk of uterine cancer. So I now wanna present the data from the P1 trial. This was the first breast cancer prevention trial. It was a randomized trial that enrolled close to 16,000 women who were selected to take either tamoxifen or placebo for five years. The study period was from 1992 until 1997. So women were eligible for this study if they were 60 years or older, or if they were between the ages of 35 and 59 and had a five-year predicted risk for breast cancer that was greater than 1.66% or had a diagnosis of LCIS. Women needed to be healthy without evidence of breast cancer and they needed to not be pregnant to participate in the study. And they could also not be on hormone replacement therapy. Breast cancer risk was determined by the Gale model. This included, um, this, model includes age, number of first degree relatives with breast cancer, whether a woman has had children or not, and the age of the first live birth if they have had children. It also includes the number of breast biopsies and whether a woman has a diagnosis of atypical hyperplasia in their age of menarche, which is their first period. So we still use this model to estimate breast cancer risk, but we also use the Tyler Cusick model, which includes more extensive family history of breast cancer, including whether there's um, second degree relatives with breast cancer. And then we also, um, in our risk assessments, like to incorporate um, 
the information about breast density on mammogram as part of the risk estimation. So these models do have limitations when we use them in certain settings because they can overestimate the risk or underestimate the risk in certain patients. So in the P1 trial, after five years of follow-up, tamoxifen was shown to reduce the risk of invasive and non-invasive breast cancer by 50%. This was statistically significant. In 2005, at seven years of follow-up, the P1 study demonstrated that after five years of tamoxifen, it not only prevented breast cancer while women were on treatment, but it reduced the risk of breast cancer after treatment had stopped. So in the placebo arm over this period, um, 250 women had been di diagnosed with invasive breast cancer compared to 145 in the tamoxifen arm. The most serious side effect was pulmonary embolism, which are blood clots in the lungs. And this was statistically significant since a 95% confidence interval is above one in the data. Women on tamoxifen at an age greater than 50 were most likely to have a pulmonary embolism, you know, among the patients that had pulmonary embolisms, it was a rare event. And there was also a trend towards more stroke and deep vein thromboses, but this was not statistically significant. So since blood clots were most significant in older women who took tamoxifen for chemo prevention, this means that it is best to treat younger women with tamoxifen who are high risk for breast cancer in their 40s or 50s, as opposed to, you know, starting this medication for prevention in a, you know, 70 or 80 year old woman. And they are, the younger women are also more likely to benefit when they are younger, and they have a less likelihood of a serious complication like a blood clot. So I wanna talk briefly about the second study. It's called IBIS-1. This study confirmed the result that we saw in P1 that breast cancer reduction with tamoxifen occurs while on therapy and after therapy had stopped. The IBIS-1 study had a longer follow-up and showed a reduction in breast cancer during five years on therapy and 15 years after therapy had stopped. So this is pretty huge. And the benefit was primarily in reducing estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, which we know is the most common cause of breast cancer in the United States and in the world. So after the tamoxifen and placebo studies, tamoxifen was compared to raloxifene in the STAR trial, and this was done in postmenopausal women. Compared to tamoxifen, raloxifene causes less endometrial cancer, less uterine hyperplasia, less blood clots. So the side effect profile is a little bit more favorable than tamoxifen, but it's also less efficacious compared to tamoxifen in preventing breast cancer. So I tell people TAM reduces the risk by 50% over five years and raloxifene maybe reduces the risk only by 40%. So there were two trials that looked at aromatase inhibitors for breast cancer prevention in postmenopausal women, and they were both efficacious. This is the trial for extamestane. This is the trial for anastrozole. And when I talk in the clinic to patients about these options, the biggest barrier and worry that patients um, speak to me about is hot flashes. And we all have very negative images of hot flashes. This picture is my favorite here where the woman has a, like a volcano erupting inside of her. Hot flashes can be daily and they can be debilitating. However, most patients do just fine with these medications for breast cancer prevention. In regards to the other serious side effects, the blood clot risk with tamoxifen is low at 0.5%. The endometrial cancer risk is low at 0.4%. And the endometrial cancer risk does not extend after therapy has stopped. In contrast to tamoxifen, aromatase inhibitors do not have the blood clot risk. They do not have the endometrial cancer risk, but they can cause bone loss and they have more joint aches and pains. And I actually find that most patients um, do not tolerate aromatase inhibitors as well as tamoxifen. And so if a woman starts on an aromatase inhibitor and they're feeling unwell, what I advise is to take a two week break, stop the aromatase inhibitor, see how they feel. You can all kind of get a new baseline and then switch to either tamoxifen or raloxifene. We have other options. 
So in all of these trials, these medications were not associated with an increased risk of coronary heart disease or strokes at a significant level. There was a slight trend of more coronary artery disease events and strokes in the P1 trial, but this was not statistically significant compared to placebo. There is a slight increased risk of cataracts with tamoxifen, but this is very rare again, and it's very intervenable with surgery. So uptake of risk-reducing therapies is low. In trials, around 25% of women who are high risk for breast cancer will do risk-reducing therapies. In the real world, it's only around eight, maybe 9% will try a medication for prevention. Factors that are associated with a higher likelihood to try a medication include an abnormal breast biopsy, so this LCIS or atypical hyperplasia. Patients are more likely to try these medications if their doctor recommends it. If a patient has a higher objective risk of breast cancer, if a patient has fewer side effect concerns going into it, or if they are older in age, yes, older women are more likely to try chemo prevention, but as I showed before, younger women are more likely to benefit and have less side effects. So in this context, a low dose tamoxifen study was performed in Italy. And the study looked at five milligrams of tamoxifen compared to 20 milligrams, which was the standard. The idea that five milligrams would be more tolerable. They also looked at a shorter duration of therapy of three years. The women were randomized in the study to tamoxifen five versus placebo. So this wasn't a study of tamoxifen five versus TAM 20. We don't have that data. This was tamoxifen five versus placebo. And they included women with DICS, D DCIS, which means they had a higher chance of developing invasive breast cancer. So this is the study flow. 253 women took tamoxifen for three years and 247 were randomized to placebo. Note how this was approximately 500 women compared to the P1 trial where they had 16,000 women. So among patients that stopped treatment in the trial due to side effects, 29 were in the tamoxifen arm and 21 were in the placebo arm. Yes, you heard that right. Women receiving the placebo reported side effects and stopped therapy. This is something that we always see when placebos are given in trials. So the study showed that low dose tamoxifen for three years reduced the incidence of invasive breast cancer. This is a big result and this is practice changing. So compared to placebo, women with tamoxifen did have more frequent hot flashes. Between tamoxifen five milligrams and placebo, there was not a significant difference though in hot flash intensity, vaginal dryness, or musculoskeletal pain. However, for both vaginal dryness and musculoskeletal pain, they increased with time over the three years of the study. This is because aging is hard. You develop more dryness and get more achy with age. And so this happens, unfortunately. So with low dose tamoxifen, there were low rates of endometrial cancer in blood clots. And so this study wasn't powered to make big conclusions about how these side effects compared to full dose tamoxifen. Um, but overall, you know, the results are favorable. And, you know, I tell patients that this low do dose option is a great option. It has also been studied at a lower dose at 2.5 milligrams and has been shown to decrease breast density. This is, is an advantage too, since lower breast density allows for early detection. So I think um, earlier, Dr. King had stated the average risk of breast cancer is 12%, but with extremely dense breasts, it is increased to 16 to 19%. So even at like a low dose of tamoxifen, if that modulates breast density, that can be favorable in patients who are higher risk of breast cancer. So in VPREP, since we began in 2017, about 23% of patients with high-risk lesions like atypical hyperplasia and LCIS will start chemo prevention. We found that up to one-third of women will start greater than six months after their first visit. This means that women need to ponder the decision and may need more than one discussion before trying therapy. So since we started offering low-dose tamoxifen, it has actually become one of our more popular options in VPREP. 
For most women, I recommend starting at five milligrams. And if they feel well at five milligrams, we try to work up to 20 milligrams if they're able to tolerate therapy. And the reason why I try to go to 20 is we have more data to support that in regards to um, prevention. However, if patients feel best on five milligrams or 10 milligrams, I'm fine with that too. So in conclusion, medications can prevent breast cancer in both pre and postmenopausal women who are high risk for breast cancer. There's a lower chance of serious side effects if women try these therapies between the ages of 40 and 50. Tamoxifen lowers the risk of breast cancer while on therapy and 15 years after therapy has stopped. Low dose tamoxifen may be more tolerable than 20 milligrams and low dose TAM can decrease breast density on mammogram. The field is evolving and we hope that through clinical trials, more options will be available in the future to reduce a woman's risk of breast cancer. Thank you, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Piskowski. That was a wonderful overview and, and always nice to see our own uh, data from the clinic. Um, I think I was able to answer some of the questions while you were speaking. Uh, one just came in now. What was the name of the trial for the tamoxifen five milligram three-year trial? Oh, so it's, um, a, I actually don't know if it had an official name. Do you know, <laughs> Dr. King? I think it's kind of called the low-dose tamoxifen trial. Um, yes, I, oh, well, we just got an answer from the audience. TAM01. Oh, TAM01. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yes, you. We, uh, we talk about these things. We don't necessarily, if it's not a catchy name, we might not remember it. Exactly. Um, uh, so one other question, would taking uh, TAM five milligrams make sense after you've already taken uh, 20 milligrams of TAM for maybe five years or seven years? I, I don't think so. So if a patient has already taken tamoxifen 20 milligrams for, for five years in the prevention setting, you know, we believe the data that shows that it will reduce the risk of breast cancer even after therapy has stopped. So I, I wouldn't recommend um, kind of extended therapy of tamoxifen in the prevention setting.